So thanks to the grace of heaven, the holy teachers, the Dao, uh, the masters, the Dao seniors, and everyone here today for giving me the opportunity to present today's lecture, Why Should One Receive Dao? Um, Emily, since you're here, um, we don't have any new weekly announcements, but let's just test your knowledge. Emily, what is the first thing you should do when you arrive at the temple? Yes, um, can you walk me through the process? So what should, you, what should you do at the front door? Okay, and then after doing three bows, do you want to head upstairs and then do... And then you do the at the Okay, and then, and then what, do you, what would you be doing after the Sanjali? Uh, go say hello to all the masters and everyone. Yes, that is correct. You do say hello to the masters with how many bows? One. Okay. You forgot one thing though. So then after doing the morning, I and mean after doing the tanja, there's also a lot of chairman and Yamizan uh, is the portraits. And you also want to make sure you do three bows to show your respect to them too. Alright. Okay. Thank you, Emily. So we are good for that. And then common temple terminology. Emily, let's test you, I guess. Uh, refer to yourself as. Okay, refer to others as. Or. Do you remember the second one? No, so it would be a uh, Chen Xian. And then refer to masters as. Refer to temple host as. And finally, refer to lectures as. Okay, and can you tell me which two or more uh, optional terms that you do not necessarily have to be using? That's correct, thank you. Okay, so today's lecture. Uh, first, we'll be going over receive what Tao, and then afterwards, what is Tao, and then where can one find Tao, and finally, why should I receive Tao, and then I'll summarize this with a conclusion. So, receive what Tao. The Tao we receive today is the same as the Tao of the Buddhas in the past. The Tao cultivators of the past had to travel over 1,000 kilometers to find a master, over 10,000 kilometers to get three treasures, and they had to earn over 3,800 merits in order to even have a chance for Buddha to pass down the Tao. So in the past, what happened was you had to first cultivate, and then you can own, and then after cultivating, you can you have the possibility of receiving Tao in order to become a Buddha. These days, we are much more fortunate because of the difference, the, the new, the time period. Everyone today has the opportunity to first receive Tao. And when after receiving Tao, then we begin cultivating. So the spread of Tao is no longer limited to a single individual, passing it on to another. Because in the past, when you pass down Tao through generations, it was always from one individual to another. But now, everyone has the opportunity to receive Tao. And this is very important because by receiving Tao, we can have the opportunity to escape the cycle of reincarnation and find our true soul. And only by receiving Tao will we understand what Tao is, really, and we'll find we'll, we'll learn that Tao is the root of our origin. So if we do not receive Tao, it may be very hard for us to realize our origins. And if we don't realize our origins, it, we might not be able to determine what's the purpose of life on earth, and what's the purpose of death, and what happens after death. So what is Tao exactly? Tao can, Tao can be dis categorized through three statements. First, Tao is the truth. Second, Tao is the path. 
And third, Tao comes from pure heart. So you might think Tao, that Tao is something that is very good, but you might be unable to exactly define it. Or you might just be uncertain, uh, you may just be uncertain what Tao is at all. Is at all. And this is a very normal feeling because originally Tao is supposed is only the truth that can be understood through emotions. Something that was not describable through words. Once we receive Tao, however, we now know the existence of Tao. That Tao exists. But where exactly is Tao? Where, can, where exactly can we see, hear, smell, or touch Tao? Tao is shapeless, it's soundless, and it's odorless. Yet Tao exists. So, how, where exactly is it? Well, in reality, Tao is actually everything and everywhere. Although this is still not a complete and entirely accurate explanation. Because, once again, Tao cannot exactly be explained through words. It's mainly understood through emotions. But to give an example of something that we can use to relate to what Tao really is, if it's undescribable, think of Tao as like the wind. When we use our hands to make a sweeping motion on our skin, we can feel a very light breeze. Most likely, unless you sweep really hard and you hit something, you will not hear anything when you make this motion. You, you cannot see the breeze and there should not be any smell to the breeze. But you can feel it and by feeling it, you know that there's something there. Tao is just like this breeze, but it's on a much greater scale. So instead of just applying this, uh, this breeze example to your hand, apply the idea of Tao to everything in life. So, uh, so now going into the three the statements. First, Tao is the truth. So we all know that there are some things that can easily be described about, about Earth. For example, the sky has stars, the moon rises at the night, and the sun in the day. We have four seasons that change periodically in the same order every year, and each season always has very similar characteristics. We have daytime, and we have nighttime, and we have the weather. The earth has trees that, and trees will always be growing upwards, or at least it won't be going, it won't be growing downwards. And if we follow the flow of water, water always flows downwards by nature. So unless there's some kind of human intervention through a machine, water would not be flowing upwards. The people are generations, uh, the people are categorized into generations and we have ancestors that we are related to. So all of these things I've said can be considered essentially facts. And all of these are facts because the Tao controls all of these. And the Tao plays a role in, determine, in making all of these be considered true. So even though, it might, even though it might seem hard to believe that everything I've described, what we take for granted, is related to Tao, the truth is, Tao is affiliated with all of these, whether we believe them or not. Second, Tao is the path. So, you can think of Tao as like a non-stop airplane that prevents us from straying off the path. Now, where exactly is this path headed to? Well, the path is he guiding, the path is headed us to, he is heading us and guiding us to heaven. There are many ways of, you can think of getting to heaven as in many ways. For example, you might, you can think of traveling by boat, by car. There's many different forms of transportation. And that's the same with Tao and trying to get to heaven. Although there may be other ways of getting to heaven, there, the, the other ways will not be as efficient as um, as receiving Tao and using Tao as the, our path to getting to heaven. So even if we don't receive Tao, it is still possible for us to return to heaven. 
but there will be many stops along the way, and it may take more merits needed if we receive them. What, what this is describing is reincarnation. So we can think of this as the same as the, using the transportation an analogy. Because Tao is a non-stop airplane, right? Tao will take us from point A, our starting point, which is here on Earth, to point B, which is heaven. And, um, and as long as we continuously cultivate and try to improve ourselves and earn merit, it will be non-stop and we won't have to take any detours. But there are other ways of traveling, such as car, walking, biking, and so those ways, although they can still get you to your destination, depending on what your destination is exactly, it will most definitely take much longer time than to do so by an airplane. Finally, Tao comes from pure heart. So we want to categorize our, we want to categorize, um, our heart into two different hearts. One is the human heart, and the second is the heavenly heart. And let me just, just briefly describe what's the difference between these two hearts. So when we talk about the human heart, we talk about the things that we are most comfortable and familiar with. Our emotions, such as happiness, anger, greed, sadness, selfishness. So everything that makes us human, essentially and what we face on a daily basis. And these emotions, although there are some that are very positive, many of them can create problems and cause a lot of pain. And many of these are what we are trying to improve on and hopefully get rid of, or at least decrease the, um, the intensity over time, such as anger and greed and selfishness. Whereas the heavenly heart is what we as humans currently do not have and what we are trying to strive for when we cultivate. So what can we use to describe the heavenly heart? Some words can be like the Buddha's heart, our true heart, wisdom, our soul. So think of this, uh, think of the heavenly heart as the pure essence of what we used to be before we became humans, before we came to this earth. And when we came to this earth, we, we no longer have the heavenly heart. And that is what we strive to aim for, to get back our heavenly heart. So we have to, current, as Tao cultivators, we have to try to be using our heavenly heart to complete our actions. And this is essential, this is what we would be calling Tao. For example, think of this, think of it like this. And many of us may not realize that we actually have two hearts, because we no longer have the heavenly heart, so we may not realize what we have really lost, and we may just think that we only have one heart, the human heart. But think of this as an example. Fish need water to swim, but they may not, be, they may, they may not re really realize what water is until they, leave, until they are forced to leave the water, and only after they leave will they then realize how important water is. So this is the same for us. Many of us can be thought of as these fish. We don't know that we need to be cultivating ourselves because, um, because, that, because once we revive, once we are here on earth, we no longer have our heavenly heart. But once we receive Tao and we start cultivating, then we learn about the heavenly heart and how important it is. And then we realize that we should be striving and working towards the heavenly heart. When humans meet disasters, it is often only in these situations do we realize the importance of breeding and living. So it is very important that from today, that we realize the importance of Tao because Tao is essentially our own soul. So I've been talking about what is Tao, but where exactly can we find Tao? Siddhartha Gautama gave up his status as a prince to cultivate and became a monk. Nanhai Gufo was also a princess and she too gave up her status to cultivate. So both of these um, predecessors and many others, they had to travel very far and they had to go on pilgrimages to find masters in order to try to cultivate Tao. 
and find where exactly Tao is. So even in the past, they faced the same question as we do today, which is where is Tao? And although to even to this day, there are many people that still do so. They still go to pilgrimages, they go to more isolated places to try to find uh, to try to find a location where they can be cultivating, especially those from educated places such as America. The people might go to places such as China and India to find to try to seek the answer to this question. Few actually find Tao and cultivate. And this is because Tao is not something that is accomplished by going into caves and meditating in isolation. Instead, Tao is found on the people. It's found within you and me and everyone else. So you do not actually need to seek for it elsewhere. Instead, if you want to, if you want to find the answer to this question, all you have to do is look to yourself, your inner self. And that from your inner self, you can find Tao and you can learn to cultivate it. So if people who are cultivating are good people that are building their character every day, they're constantly striving to improve themselves, then other people that do not necessarily know at this time what Tao is will say Tao is good and also try to, and also begin cultivating. But if the people who cultivate are not that good, others will also say Tao does not seem so good. So as cultivators, we should always start from ourselves and we should always be try, trying to do things that are morally right so that when others see us and they see our actions, they will feel that whatever we are doing, we are carrying Tao with us. This question often comes up, why should I receive Tao? Often people might say, if I'm a good person, I don't do anything bad, I, I don't eat meat, I don't hurt other people's feelings, I, try my, I volunteer at food banks, homeless shelters, why do I need to receive Tao? I'm already very good. Well, this can be actually explained through several aspects. First, many people make the misconception that kindness equals not doing bad things. But kindness is not only limited to that. It's not only just not doing bad things. A lot of people think that as long as I am not doing things that are wrong, then I am doing fine enough. And after I, after I pass away, I will be rewarded for my actions. However, many people forget that although they may be thinking that they are living a good life as a moral person the majority of the time, they also have day-to-day -day small moments where they'll face moments of bad, um, bad emotions that come from the human heart. There will be moments of greed, selfishness, blame, and they may even dislike others. And having these negative emotions will also bring oneself frustration and trouble, in addition to causing bad interactions with other people. So even if you think you are a good, a kind person, then it's actually even more important that you should receive Tao. Because when you receive Tao, you'll learn the words of the Buddhas and you'll be able to use them as a guideline of what it truly is to be kind and a good individual. And from there, then you can actually be sure that you are living your life to the standards that will allow you to live a good, that will allow you to prosper in the afterlife. The second reason, kindness is not enough to stop the effects of karma. We've discussed this multiple times in the last few lectures about how karma and bad, uh, bad debt can only be replaced through merit. So many kind people, when they are faced with an obstacle or a challenge, they may often have difficulties overcoming it. They may be defeated, they may have feelings of giving up, feelings of hopelessness, and in during these moments, they may do things 
that are not necessarily good. They ha may have bad judgment calls. And if they, if they do so, if they actually carry out whatever they are thinking in the moment, then their actions would result in them no longer being kind. So life has meant too many obstacles. It's like the waves of the ocean that can sweep you away. And it, and it is in these challenges, during these moments, that it is very important to have the blessings of the Buddha. Because if you have the blessings of the Buddha, you have the security and reassurance that there is someone there higher than you, protecting you. So then you can rely on the Buddha during these moments and you will be sure that you will not lose your way. Finally, the third reason. Kindness cannot help you escape reincarnation. So even if you're very fortunate and you not face many challenges in your lifetime, there are still a few things that most people, that almost everyone will go through. Most people will get old, they will get sick, and everyone will one day die. These things are inevitable, you cannot avoid them. So often, kindness alone cannot make you be unafraid when these times come. When you are old, when you are fearing death, and wondering what will happen to you after you pass away, and if there will be anyone by your side. Humans are always being born and always dying. It's a cycle of reincarnation. Born, die, born, die. Where the cycle is determined based on one's depth and merit. That is always constantly changing over time. So many people often get swept up in the things that they have in their lifetimes, such as materialistic possessions, alcohol, wealth, power, fame, and they will often forget their souls. They will forget their original purpose of why they are on this earth, and that the, the relationships that they have right now, like they may be very rich in this current lifetime, but they will, for, they may not, they may forget that that does not guarantee they will be rich in their next lifetime. That everything they have in each lifetime is only temporary. That um, who their mother is in their this life may not be their mother in their next life. They may not even be related or come in contact. So everything is just a temporary connection. If you think that everything is meaningless because none of it matters in your next life, then you need to receive Tao because this is the only way to escape this endless cycle of reincarnation. And I just want to use this, um, bring this back to Prince Siddhartha, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, which I mentioned earlier, because Siddhartha Gautama realized this issue of escaping reincarnation. And that's the main reason why he gave up his status. Because he realized that although to other people it seemed like he had everything. He had rich, he had power, he had, um, he had, uh, he had, he, he was living in a life of comfort. But he realized that all of it was meaningless because once he died, none of it, he, there, none of it would fall, fall along with him. So we want to escape reincarnation where we keep on getting born because earth is not the best place we can actually be. On the earth, there's actually countless acts of violence, such as death, immoral acts. You also have sickness, hunger, disease, a lot of pain that people experience. And although there are also positive benefits on living on earth, we want to escape the bad things everything I just mentioned. And the only way to really escape is to receive Tao and cultivate so that we can go back to heaven. And I want to bring this up, I want to bring this up that even if you do not, even if you do good deeds, but you do not receive Tao, yes, you will be able to enter heaven if you have done enough, but you will only be able to enter the lowest level. And even then, you, you are only able to reside in heaven for a certain amount of time before you are required to come back down to earth. So 
without receiving Tao, although you can go to heaven, you still aren't really truly escaping reincarnation. You'll have a time limit, maybe 500 years, maybe a thousand years, but eventually you'll be required to come back down to earth and reincarnate again and cultivate and, and, spend, and live on earth as a human. So in conclusion, I just want to share this story. It's called the Four Wives Story. And hopefully through this story, it'll be able to summarize everything that we have been discussing today. So in the Four Wives Story, long ago, there was a king who had four wives. The king loved his fourth wife the most and would give her all of his riches, as most of his riches. He also deeply loved his third wife and was showing her off to neighboring kingdoms because his third wife was very beautiful. However, because he felt that his third wife was too beautiful, he always feared that she would leave him one day if he was, to run, if he was now, no longer the king or he did not have so much wealth. And his second wife was kind and considerate and was his most trusted advisor that he could seek for advice, that he could seek and talk to in his difficult times. Finally, his first wife was very devoted and loyal. And although she truly loved, she loved him deeply, he was not very interested in her and tended to ignore her. One day, the king fell very ill. He was, he was stuck, he was sick to the point that he was unable to move and stuck, on the, uh, stuck in bed. And the truth dawned on him that he might be dying. His life, was com his life might be soon coming to an end. And he thought of the luxurious life he had lived and he feared, and he feared being alone because when he died, because as king, he always had people Con, uh, people tending to him he always had people listening to him whatever he wanted he usually was able to get so he feared death and he decided that he wanted to address his fears so he asked his wives individually what they would be willing to do when he was when he would pass away he started with his fourth wife he told his fourth wife I have loved you the most endowed you with the finest clothing, showered gifts upon you, and taken great care of you. Um, now that I'm dying, would you be willing to follow me and keep me company? The fourth wife replied, no way, and walked away without another wife, or without another word. The king was very sad, but he thought, I still have the third wife and the second wife. So he asked the third wife next, I have loved you all my life. I am now dying. Will you follow me and keep me company? The third wife replied, No. Life is too good for me. When you die, I'm going to remarry. I'm going to make sure I live the current comfortable life I'm living in with plenty of wealth, power, and attention. He felt very sad but he decided that he could at least count on the second wife because the second wife was his closest friend essentially. So he then asked his second wife, I have always turned to you for help and you have always been there for me. When I die, will you follow me and keep me company? His wife, however, replied with a very surprising response that he did not think. I'm sorry. But unlike the times in the past where I was able to offer you my advice, I, this time I really cannot help you out. At the very most, I can help prepare your funeral. Make sure you have a very proper burial with plenty of on. And so you can. Then a voice called out to the king in his sadness. I'll leave with you and follow you no matter where you go. The king looked and re I saw that it was his first wife. His first wife had became very skinny and undernourished, and he had not seen his first. And he did not realize this. He was shocked because he had not seen his first wife in a very long time. 
Greatly grieved, the king said, he told his first wife, I should have taken much better care of you when I had a chance. And these four wives are actually representations of our lives. Each of us actually have all four of these wives. Our fourth wife is our body. No matter how much time and effort we spend in making it look good, it'll leave us when we die. Our body will either be burnt, or be chopped, uh, burnt, and it'll be buried, or in the past, if it was uh, chopped up and left alone uh, for the outside, for um, and then our third wife is a representation of our possessions. It's our status and wealth. We always, many of us during our lives, focus on this, on our third wife. We want to build our status. We want to be well respected by others. We want to build our wealth. We want to have a lot of money. And we want to have a lot of possessions so that other people will look to us as having very, as having lived a good life. But the truth is, when we die, everything we've worked on so hard in this life, the possessions, the status, the wealth, none of us can actually go with us into the afterlife. It would only go to all of this will actually go to other people. May it be our family or strangers in charity. The, the main point is we don't get to keep any of it. And it'll be divided up. Finally, our second wife, the trusted advisor of the king, represents our family and friends. No matter how much they have supported and loved us in our lifetime, the furthest they can stay with us, uh, stay by us, is up to our burial site. When we pass away, our family and friends cannot go with us. So, and finally, our first wife is our soul. It's our inner self. And it's what we often neglect in pursuit of everything else. The third wife, the wealth, power, pleasures. The second wife, building relationships with our friends and family. And the fourth, uh, the fourth wife, our body. However, it is all our first wife, our soul, that is the only thing that will follow us wherever we go. And so in conclusion, every person has things that they feel they have to accomplish in their lifetime. And everyone's goals are very different. Some of them may be very ambitious. Some of them may not be that ambitious, but still important goals. The main point thing, the main point is though, that if there is one thing that every one of us must strive to do in our lifetime, it is to receive Tao. Because, and not only just for ourselves, but to also uh, to also spread the Tao to our, co to our loved ones and to anyone that we think plays a significant role in our lives. Because when we receive Tao, the Master is opening our right door and we are already forming a connection with the Mila Buddha, uh, with our Heavenly Mother. So I hope that if you have not already, that you and your loved ones could get to quickly get the opportunity to receive Tao and begin cultivating.